Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm Trevor McMillan. I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at, at Keele University. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our, our lecture this evening, and clearly in particular, uh, a very great welcome to our lecturer, Dame Fiona Wolfe, uh, who I will talk a little bit more about in a, in a little while. Um, some of you who have just listened to me for a few minutes next door will know that this evening's lecture is part of the formal launch of a new initiative here at Kiel. Our new Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences is about bringing people together from across the university and from different disciplines, bringing them together to meet and talk and make new relationships, and in so doing, we believe we will greatly enhance both the impact and influence um, of our whole Kiel community. The more complex and intractable problems that society faces today genuinely require the integration of knowledge and understandings from different disciplines and indeed from different parts of the world. And at Kiel, we believe that it's part of our role to address some of these problems through the world-class research that we do, but also to produce graduates from both undergraduate and postgraduate programs that have the knowledge, maturity, and confidence to cross those disciplinary boundaries and have a real impact on the society in which they live. Our Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences aims to help facilitate this, and this evening's lecture uh, is an event within the programme of the Institute. It's part of the Friends of Kiel programme, and indeed it's a broader university lecture. So in itself, is showing how we hope to stimulate that interaction from different populations associated with the university. Now, this evening's lecturer, Dame Fiona Wolf, has a CV that certainly cannot be done justice to in a short introduction like this. Fiona is an energy and infrastructure lawyer with CMS Cameron McKenna, who has advised over 28 governments and the World Bank on energy reforms and infrastructure. She has 25 years experience in dealing with regulation, market design, implementation and major projects in the, in, in the uh, electricity industry. And this was rewarded with a CBE in 2002 for a contribution to the UK knowledge economy and in invisible earnings. She's worked with the World Bank on regional markets, regulation and infrastructure and that serves more than one country. For example, she worked with the World Bank on regional transmission line projects to enable post-conflict countries such as Liberia and Sierra Leone to import electricity. Dame Fiona studied law here at Kiel and in Strasbourg before qualifying as a solicitor in 1973. Now indeed, we are currently celebrating 50 years of the School of Law at Kiel. And consistent with the theme of this evening, the school's ethos is characterized by an outward looking approach, an international ambition, and indeed a world view. So one of the core 50th anniversary initiatives within the law school is a 50 years in 50 words campaign. So through this campaign, we will profile our alumni and their achievements. And this is centering around a statement of approximately 50 words from that individual, summarizing their experience of Kiel and their professional achievements. As one of our highly valued and supportive alumni, we invited Dame Fiona to be the first of our alumni to contribute to this campaign. And the statement is now set up on the slide that you have in front of you. Except it's just disappeared. Oh no, oh, it's disappeared on my bits up there, so that's fine. So I'll leave you to read that. So the plan with this is to secure 50 statements, principally from alumni, but also from others with a close connection to the school, including former staff and honorary degree holders and they will be displayed in various fora. But back to Fiona's background. She worked in the corporate and banking fields in Clifford Chance for five years before moving to CMS Cameron McKenna, where she became the, first, the firm's first female partner and ran its banking and project finance practice in Bahrain for three years. She was a senior fellow at Harvard University and she's been awarded honorary doctorates by us at Keele, but also by the College of Law, and she's an honorary bencher of the Middle Temple. She was Lord Mayor of London in 1314, during which she extensively promoted the UK-based service sector, diversity and inclusion, and the sustainable low-carbon economy, 
which she continues to promote through her honorary presidency of the Aldersgate Group. She now chairs the advisory board of the Continuing Power of Diversity Programme for the City Corporation. Continuing her passion for promoting STEM subjects in schools, she's now a trustee of the Science Museum Group of Five Museums, and she's also a trustee of Rally International, a charity that inspires young volunteers from around the world to work with communities living in poverty. She was president of the Law Society of England and Wales in 2006 to 7, and a member of the Competition Commission and a non-executive director of Affinity Water Limited, both from 2005 to 2013. She became a DBE in the New Year's Honours List 2015 for her services to the legal profession, diversity and the City of London. I therefore have great pleasure in inviting Dame Fiona Wolfe to come to the stage to deliver her lecture this evening entitled Power, Reputation and Influence, Confronting the Challenges of the New Normal. Dame Fiona. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm immensely honoured to have been in, I'm invited to deliver this lecture here, and I can't thank you all enough for coming to hear me. The title sounds like a horror movie set in Westminster or maybe Washington. It could be science fiction, but as we're in a university that is notably forward-thinking, always wondering how it can do well and do better. I will attempt to transport you into the future this evening using the technique that we all loved in Back to the Future, stretching our minds forward, but darting back to the present to look at the evidence that will enable us to make better decisions as to what different sections of society will need to do to rise to the challenges of the 21st century. We do have plenty of evidence on which to anticipate those challenges. We have known for some time that we are in what I called, as Lord Mayor, the new normal. A resource-constrained planet with all the uncertainties of climate change and a growing and also aging population. We know that society is increasingly looking to cities for greater opportunity all sit successful cities are struggling with growth at an amazing rate. We need energy and infrastructure, but we must take care of the environment and the atmosphere, or they'll kill us. Kiel has not just responded to the challenges of the new normal, but is also working to anticipate them in all that it does. I'll talk a little about the Sustainability Hub in a moment, but the description of the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences, which you've just heard, took me back to my foundation year in this very lecture theatre 50 years ago. My goodness, is it 50 years ago? When my mind was opened and my intellect challenged. I'm fond of saying that we did a bit of everything and I've used its legacy all my life. The Institute, as you've heard, is focused on multi and interdisciplinary thinking and collaboration to solve pressing societal and scientific issues. We need humanities, social and natural sciences to work together, no more silos, but integrated thinking. And in my day job as an electricity lawyer, which is really about a marriage of physics, engineering, economics, and law. And in my role as an ambassador for UK PLC in the city, I'm, ex I'm observing the growing call for collaboration and integrated thinking and integrated financial reporting to enable us to make better decisions. The Chartered Institute of Management Accountants have just published a report called joining the dots, decision-making for a new era. I think they mean the new normal. Citing four key areas, interpreting new data sources, that's including coping, coping with big data, 
learning from past outcomes, enabling challenges to traditional thinking, valuing difference, and lastly, deeper collaboration. The description of the challenges facing the 21st century society creates a picture. The technical term, curiously for it, is a cartoon from which we must weave a very strong tapestry to support all aspects of society for the rest of this critical 21st century. Not only do we know the challenges, but we also know that governments, central and local, are also very resource constrained, and particularly they're running out of money. So now is the time to weave that big society, very strong tapestry, which was an idea of the coalition government, but it never really developed. My concept of the tapestry is where the warp consists of the strong vertical elements or pillars of society, government, regulators, charities, foundations, business, academia, and individuals, including our young people. These are the multicolored threads that will create the strength to sustain the tapestry's resilience and effectiveness. The threads in the weft that I will talk about this evening are platinum, gold, and silver power, reputation, and influence, which each thread in the warp has and must use, but carefully and appropriately, lest they tarnish. They must create greater strength by collaboration, something that in the 21st century, the young do naturally, having been brought up on social media and now happily working together in open plan and open spaces. The tapestry will be flimsy if I were to define power, reputation, and influence narrowly in terms of command, control, money, or even the cult of the celebrity. We no longer think of them anyway in black and white terms. We talk of soft power. And I was conscious during my year of the power, reputation, and influence of the role of the Lord Mayor, not least in terms of delivering messages, holding events, and using that wonderful neutral ability, the power of convening debates and conversations, something that universities can do to add value and to increase their reputations to command even more credibility. I'd like to use the lens of collaboration, particularly with academia and with the charity sector, to argue that we can weave a stronger tapestry to deal with society's problems. The obvious place to start looking at the pillars of society or vertical threads in the tapestry is the concentration of power and influence of government not just in command and control, but in, in enabling, liberalizing, and devolving the solution of the complex societal issues to those organizations, including universities and charities, which have the skills, innov innovative ability, and sheer passion to do a good job, and are prepared to be transparent and share their learning. Philanthropy, education, and research may only meet a relatively small percentage of the direct cost of solving current societal issues, but if they can be used creatively to deliver innovation that can be shared, that's a kind of leveraging power, they will make an enormous difference in terms of scale and scope in the future. Universities have a very special role in supporting government with research and thinking that will provide evidence to inform decision making, quite apart from the innovation and the intellectual capacity of its students that will fuel the economy and help society rise to its challenges. I spent six stimulating months at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. 
my first day was 9-11. And I was impressed by how much it was asked to contribute to government debate and thinking around the world. And Harvard has a very special reputation to protect, which actually might be a bit limiting, but it's hard to see the evidence of that. We know that government uses the third sector and academia, as well as business, to implement government policy. At one end of the spectrum, there are the highly specified payment by results contracts, and at the other, soft grants. In the third sector, new social enterprises have emerged, subject to hard measures which can create real incentives to go the extra distance and achieve good outcomes, even if there is a bit of a risk of short-termism and doing the minimum to get by. And at the other end, the spotlight has fallen on the reputational consequences of soft grants to charities with little or no accountability or measurement of outcomes, but trusting that the charities will get it right. You would expect me to mention Kids Company in this context and the reputational embarrassment to so many of its supporters. Governments need to remember that their power and influence will set the reputation not just of the country as a place in which to live, work, learn, research and invest, but of all its nationals. I was delighted and staggered as to how well regarded we are in the UK when I travelled to 26 countries in my ambassadorial role as Lord Mayor. Education, training and qualifications came up in nearly every meeting and I was averaging about a dozen a day. Our collective reputations make us stronger as a force for good on the global as well as the domestic stage, and more likely to be able to create really useful and lasting partnerships, never mind about attracting investment and creating jobs. We know that collaboration is the name of the game, and what better way to create the relationships than by attracting students to our universities from overseas and keeping them, and keeping the bonds with them after they've graduated. I was going to spend the next hour talking on the subject of our visa policy, but I've decided to skip that in the interest of speed. The regulators also have absolute power, but often on a delegated basis. They have huge influence, both formal and informal, to enable and encourage they also need to watch their reputations, both institutionally and personally. And after all, what we want to be able to say is that a sector is well-regulated and not over-regulated. The Charity Commission has worked to achieve improvements in governance, although you would wonder how the chair of Kids Company could have been there for so long. Standards of professionalism, resilience, reserves, transparency and accountability have all been what they've wanted to focus on. As with financial and professional services, regulation of charities needs a forward-thinking approach that is not fixated on yesterday's problems, but which encourages innovation and captures the passion of those who work in the charity sector. It would be good to spread the knowledge of high standards, new approaches and good outcomes and impacts. Micromanagement by regulators doesn't work, nor does pushing a particular social or political agenda. A regulator can use its strong influencing powers by gentle persuasion and the power of convening. It's tempting to think that there are so many small charities competing for funds in the same space that the Commission should influence them to merge and to capture economies. 
But I suspect that the reason that it resists that temptation is that perhaps competition is not unhelpful in some cases, and that letting a thousand flowers bloom may achieve community benefits and new ideas. But failures are very instructive, as we know from Kids' <coughs> Company, and the Charity Commission should not be shy of drawing the lessons to our attention. But it should not undermine the reputation of or the confidence in the charity sector either. And there is a balance to be achieved, and this balance has challenged other regulators, such as those in the financial services and energy sectors, where, it, again, it has not been helpful for regulators to undermine confidence in people really doing difficult jobs. So let me now turn to the charity sector itself, which is dealing with some of the most difficult societal problems. And perhaps it is a, as a result of regulatory, donor, and trustee pr pressure that charities are having to raise their game as the availability of public finance, both central and local, declines. I might use the word professionalized, perhaps. We can expect these pressures to continue, and they will affect the way in which trustees use their charities' power, reputation, and influence, which, as we have seen, can become tarnished very easily. And I'm not just thinking about Kids' Company and other charity failures, but the witch hunt in the press about aggressive marketing and se selling mailing lists, which then spills over to criticisms of CEO pay levels. I think that there may have been a reluctance to address lessons from failure, but we shall all be stronger by sharing the learning. It is, of course, not straightforward to measure success, to assess and compare the impact and outcomes of, for example, a charity that is a recruitment agency for women ex-offenders or a hospice, or a school, or a university. We can think of the wider benefits, or the net benefits, the immediate, or the long-term benefits, the local and the global. But the good thing about this sector is that there is something for everyone. And the challenge in the 21st century is for us to use our powers and influence to feed and water it so that all fruitful and innovative flowers, if I may mix my metaphors, can bloom. And I could also make the same point about universities. Of course, universities are charities too, constantly looking to raise funds for education, research, and capital projects without which they will struggle to remain competitive and survive. Now, this might be a moment for me to promote Kiel's exciting plans and worthy causes, but I suspect you know them. And if you don't know them, you haven't been opening your emails. So let me recommend that you do that. But I'll return to Kiel's role in the new normal in a moment. A key figure in the new normal and... I have to say, a key figure in the success of the Conference of the Parties 21 in Paris in December is Lord Stern, Nick Stern, the great economist and climate diplomat who linked climate change to the opportunities to create economic growth at the same time as transitioning to a low-carbon economy at very little extra cost. He's president of the British Academy, which commissions and funds research in the humanities and social sciences from all our universities. Together, of course, they all have great power, reputations and influence. But do they use them collectively? And how many of you heard about the, Ac the Académie Française 
before you heard about the British Academy. It's an organization with a great reputation, but I've challenged it to use that reputation to become better known, which would, I feel, increase the potential of its undoubted power and influence. And maybe that is a message for all universities. Universities and schools have so much to give in helping us to use our own power, reputation and influence with wisdom. In helping to society to deal with the most complex issues of the new normal, research and evidence gathering will be more important than ever. They will be the basis for better governance and decision making at all levels. And my definition of governance, good governance, is not about rules and processes and board composition. It's about ensuring good quality, timely decision making. Business does well to partner with universities and schools for its own reasons, funding capital projects, chairs and research programs. I do worry a little in this context about maintaining intellectual freedom and also about postgraduate post funding at the immediate postgraduate uh, level to develop the academic elite for the rest of this century. And I think we should all use some personal power and influence to assist. During my time at Harvard, I saw the three pillars of a university working together education, research, and engagement with society. Universities, and I have to say, Kiel, being unique is very much included, have great power, reputation, and influence, and should debate whether they can use it more effectively to collaborate as well as compete as institutions. It's clear that Kiel's own sustainability hub is at the forefront of the thinking to address the challenges of the new normal. Its MSc in Environmental Sustainability and Green Technology is run in conjunction with local industry partners, and it provides consultancy services, leveraging the considerable power, reputation, and influence of Kiel's iconic Chancellor, Jonathan Porritt. It uses its convening powers to offer courses for business schools, visitors, and the community, embedding forward thinking in everyone, especially in the bright young people whose intellectual capacity it is pushing about, is extending. The research projects are both collaborative and interdisciplinary, leading to a wide range of impressive outcomes from patent filings for new materials to understanding wave propagation, useful for at least one other, apart from me, fascinated by offshore wind <laughs> and offshore transmission, Simon, as well. Um, but there was something that caught my eye, which is reducing energy consumption through knowledge networks, networks of people, and where, I quote, trust is the key issue. I then was going to take my lecture into trust for the rest of the evening, but I thought that would take too long as well. But all these approaches and outcomes already achieved will make an important contrib contribution to policy debates, particularly in the next three years, where our government must reset its energy and climate change policies. But I sometimes wonder if universities worry that actually they're ahead of the time in research programs, for example, on refugee studies or aging. But thank heavens they are. And historical research is important too. You know, in the context of Brexit, European history and values are relevant. One of my interns is doing a PhD on the decision-making in 2008. Well, we don't want to have to model through one of those again. So the challenge is to use all possible power and influence to raise funds for research and to leverage the amazing reputations of our universities. 
The business sector, to which I now turn, has used its immense power and influence to inspire the giving of money and time in an effort to enhance its reputation with customers and staff, and maybe because actually they felt it was the right thing to do. Corporate Social Responsibility, or CSR, as it's now called, or Responsible Business, has spawned a new breed of specialists and a professional institute delivering training and standards. It has developed from short-term charity fundraising to fully-fledged foundations within companies with long-term strategies and relationships. Power and influence, as I've said, is best used to enable rather than prescribe. Business has been accused of using its CSR power over its employees to influence them all to do the same thing, however noble the strategy is. But continuing my let a thousand flowers bloom thought, there are many ways of giving money and time that can also bloom. I think that the biggest challenge to a charity or a university contemplating corporate fundraising is to find the right entry point. And I've met many charities that are actually so put off they don't even attempt it. There can be budgets and pots of money all over the place at central or business unit level with the chair, CEO, CSR, HR, or DNI professionals, if you can get those acronyms, um, holding the purse strings. The funds can be earmarked for charity, marketing, research purposes. Of course, that's highly relevant to universities. But I can't help feeling that it would be good if business could simply provide guidance for charities and universities on how to approach them and what their short and longer term CSR objectives are. And finally, let me turn to the power, reputation and influence of the individual as a member of the 21st century society in the new normal. Happily, there are more philanthropists and entrepreneurs amongst the baby boomers who've made enough money and have had the benefit of generous tax regime for pensions, but who are now worrying about where are more of them going to come from. We know that the millennials are struggling financially, I mean, obviously funding for their education and climbing on the property ladder are big challenges of the new normal. But there is evidence in the 21st century that the wealthy have preferred to create foundations rather than dynasties based on passing down inherited wealth from one generation to the next. As I learned from Philip Lawton of the Linbury Trust, we are seeing a generational shift towards social impact investing. In the past, capital projects were favored, traditional grant making, writing a cheque and leaving it to the charity to spend, and the professional asset management by someone in the city. Younger philanthropists with foundations focus on impacts and outcomes, and this is influencing the management of the endowment assets. They appear to take their powers, reputation, and influence seriously. They are visible and vocal, learning and advocating, leaving no one in doubt, in the words of the title of John Nixon's excellent book, Giving is Good for You. My current focus in promoting philanthropy is to look at the power of the individual, not the high net worth group, but the ordinary worker. I'm a fan of payroll giving, give as you earn. 1% of or even two in the case of my husband, 2% of earnings or bonuses being set aside for giving. I worked out that if everyone who works in the city were to put the price of, the cup of, of a cup of coffee into a drawer every weekday, allowing for four weeks holiday, it would raise 200 million pounds painlessly each year. 
And my wonderful Chelsea Opera Group, which provides a start in life for singers and conductors, survived the recession because of hundreds of small bankers' orders, sometimes just five pounds a quarter or even a year, from its grateful but low-income participants and supporters. So how do we as individuals exercise the power of choice? By waiting for a letter to appear in the post or an email from our old university or from a friend about to run a marathon or by trawling the internet? Well, City Corporation has an attractive matchmaking service called City Philanthropy, a world of opportunity. And interestingly, it sponsored a piece of research by the Cass Business School. Note the reference to research. It's called More to Give, and it's about the power, reputation, and influence that can be used to inspire millennials to give. We know that in the city, 80% of workers give money, but amongst the under 35s, the figure is 81% even though they don't earn anything like as much as their seniors. Perhaps it's because they're conscious after 9-11 and 2008 that economic growth brings with it huge challenges of fairness and sustainability for our communities in its wake. And they are even more conscious of the environment and climate change, of diversity, social mobility, inclusion all elements of the new normal. This is a highly mobile talent with global perspectives. They want more diversity, inclusive capitalism, yes, social mobility, as I've mentioned, but better ethics in the workplace. They want to bring their values to work. And they've taken ownership of the fact that it's their future, not ours. The research found that amongst the most powerful influences on the under 35s were workplace schemes and initiatives after the obvious immediate influence of family and friends. The immediate managers and team leaders were more influential than company leaders, celebrities and public figures. And universities might learn from this the individual power, reputation, and influence of academics is amazing. What a huge legacy they deliver to us and leave a huge footprint in our hearts when we graduate. The, the young like to collaborate and would give more if they were part of a giving team. The organization called Young Philanthropists who worked well to establish giving circles of the under 35s, have transformed what they do to capture the motivation and values and renamed their organization Beyond Me. They don't use the somewhat old-fashioned and intimidating language of philanthropy, but inspire their members to create new giving teams of seven people who typically have more time to give than money. And the active engagement motivates the giving of money in a fashion that is smarter than it might otherwise have been. And this is a message of hope for the future. Individual business leaders, teachers and academics at all level have more power and influence than they realize. Leading by example, but not prescribing. Allowing passions to flourish valuing difference, a key message for the diversity and inclusion agenda. Matched funding schemes may influence behavior, but the key influencers are the peer group, friends and colleagues, and immediate team leaders. And these team leaders are also critical to their workplace satisfaction as they control their quality of work, talent development, and career advancement. These team leaders are at mid-level and they're the focus of the next stage of my, power, or my work on the Power of Diversity program, which I started as Lord Mayor. 
They are part worker bees tasked with income generation, part emerging leaders. If they could be influenced by their seniors to adopt an inclusive leadership style, they would become very accessible role models and very influential indeed in their own right. In a nutshell, we all have the power to do more and to influence others and to enhance our reputations by doing so. But it is only by collaborating that we can weave that tapestry and water those flowers that will enable us to solve society's complicate, complex and complicated issues in the new normal. I visited Dallas recently with my husband to help him promote the St. John of Jerusalem Eye Hospital, which he chairs. We went to see the memorial at the place where John F. Kennedy was shot. In the context of power, reputation, and influence in the new normal, let me leave you with these words, which the most powerful man on earth, great with reputation and influence at that moment, would have delivered but for his assassination in the speech he was about to give. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint. Sounds brilliant, but restraint? Well, back to the title of this lecture as a horror film. Do power, reputation, and influence have to be seen in the 21st century as only abused, abusable, or abusive? I'm an, an electricity lawyer, and power for me is empowering. And my mayoral strapline was the power to transform lives. I think we should challenge ourselves, including the young, to identify our power, reputation, and influence and to use it more and to better effect. By collaborating to create the tapestry of flowers I've described, we can rise to the challenges of the new normal. And thank you to Kiel for its leadership and for having empowered me and so many others. Thank you very much.